11, 1983, the Reagan White House issued a presidential directive on safeguarding national security information, which eventually became known as National Security Directive 84, NSDD 84. The directive sought to mandate two processes to strengthen our efforts to safeguard national security information from unlawful disclosure. It would require that all federal agency officials with access to sensitive compartmented information sign an agreement to submit for pre-publication review for their entire lives any and all proposed writing. According to one source, the directive currently could affect at least 128,000 people nationwide and untold numbers in the future. It would also authorize the use of polygraph tests on all federal agency employees handling classified information to uncover the source of security information leaks. In effect, the directive extends to the entire federal government stringent provisions previously applying only to the most highly sensitive intelligence, intelligence gathering agencies. The directive, however, has serious implications not only for current and former government employees, but also for authors, publishers, booksellers, librarians, and the general public. Heather Grant Florence, Bantam Books Vice President and General Counsel and Chair of the AAP, Freedom Committee to Read, said, it is inescapable that pre-publication review process will have a pronounced chilling effect on the publishing process and a devastating impact on the informed public discussion, which is at the heart of our democratic government. Clearly, Mrs. Florence continued, material which has to go through the process will be published, if at all, in a less than timely fashion. The simple truth is that public debate, especially on issues of immediate current concern, will not await the government censor. The employees or former employees' inability to contribute to debate in timely fashion effectively silences that individual. For precisely that reason, delays engendered by the pre-publication procedures will have the effect of preventing altogether by rendering moot the publication of numerous works. were thrown off land they had worked for centuries. The ANC leader, Pigs Ligaseme, said the African awoke to find himself a pariah in the land of his birth. First you hear about it and you hear that South Africa was expelled from the Olympics. It seems such a mean thing to do, you know. Why should a bunch of nice athletes be kept out? But in fact, in South Africa, only whites could be on the Olympic team. We had black athletes who were running faster, and they were jumping higher, their performances were better, but they couldn't get on the team because the team was for whites only. Now, the Olympic Charter says that any country that discriminates against black athletes or whites on the grounds of race or religion or politics must be excluded. So it was my job to write the letters from South Africa to Chicago. 
they all came to the president of the World Olympic Committee who lived on LaSalle Street, Avery Brandage, and we sent the evidence to Chicago, which proved that the South African Olympic team was discriminating. So they were expelled from the Olympics. But partly as a result of that, I was arrested myself in the offices of the South African Olympic Committee. I was sent to prison for the crime of attending a sports meeting. I escaped twice. The first time I got to Mozambique and I was recaptured by the Portuguese secret police. They sent me back to Johannesburg. I escaped a second time in Johannesburg on a Tuesday afternoon. And I was shot in the back at close range by a member of the secret police. The bullet entered my back, came out of my chest. And after that, I was sent to Robben Island to a prison with about a thousand other political prisoners. And I spent my time there breaking stones or with a hammer on a rock pile. And after I came out of prison, I was put under house arrest for five years. My house became my prison, and I could not leave it for five years. But after one year of that, because I couldn't earn a living, I applied for permission to leave South Africa. And I was given a document called an exit permit, which meant that um, I signed an agreement that if I came back to South Africa, I would go to prison. So that's how I was able to leave the country. And of course, I continued my work outside. And by very interesting coincidence, 1964 was when South Africa was suspended from the Olympic Games, Tokyo, 1964. But in 1984, 20 years later in Los Angeles, the South Africans are trying to come back to the Olympics. They haven't changed their policy. They still keep blacks off the team, or they segregate them, or they have blacks running in one stadium and whites in another stadium. There's a law called the Group Areas Act, which says this area is for the white group and this area is for the black group. And if a black runs on the white area, he goes to prison. The law is still there, and you can be arrested under that law. What they do nowadays is they sometimes suspend the law for one day. So you can have black and white running on the same track for one day. But if they do it the following day, they go to prison. Now what they do is, once they have the event, they have the TV cameras there, and they film it and everything else, and it goes out to the rest of the world. And it gives the impression that the apartheid policy has changed. Because you see black and white drinking together, running together, on the football team together. You say, well, it's all over. In fact, that's not true. What they've done is to suspend part of the law for a short time to impress people outside, to deceive the world, in fact. But the law, which says it is a crime for black and white to run together, to swim together, to play football together, that law is still there. So what we are saying, and we're organizing a protest in Los Angeles, we are saying that if South Africa comes back, they have to remove those laws. And until those laws are removed, South Africa has no right the Olympic Reforming apartheid is impossible because the essence of apartheid is the removal of certain people from certain areas and controlling and maintaining them in um, areas that are assigned for them. At the heart of apartheid is the division of the land. Four million whites own 86%, leaving 14% for the 18 million blacks. These fragmented areas are called Bantu stands or homelands. The aim of apartheid is to clear the white areas of all unwanted non-whites, as was made clear in a 1967 government circular. It must be stressed here that no stone is to be left unturned to achieve the settlement in the homelands of non-productive Bantu at present residing in the European areas. Blacks are only allowed in the white areas to work. They must have a special pass to stay there. 
The rest, their wives, children, the unemployed, the elderly and sick, are sent to vast resettlement camps in the distant homelands. They're crammed into these camps by the hundred thousand. There is little food, few jobs and disease is rampant. To escape this plight, many women and children return to the cities to live illegally with their husbands. And many unemployed men, unable to support their families in the homelands, come illegally to the cities in search of work. They live a hunted life in squatter camps surrounding the cities, always threatened by arrest and deportation. This year, police have launched fresh raids on squatters. Thousands of South Africa's discarded people have been herded onto buses and driven out under armed guard to the distant Bantustan. To give an indication of the scale of this, um, figures for people actually charged or cases investigated during the 1970s is three and a half million people. Um, for the last three years of the 1960s, it was something like two million people once again. How many of those people would actually have been sent back to the Bantu Centre? I unfortunately can't say. It's impossible to say. The destruction and misery brought about by forced removal scars South Africa's cities. And in the countryside, scattered relics of mass deportations are easy to find. 12,000 black South Africans once lived in this valley in Natal. They owned the land for 110 years. It was a prosperous agricultural community. There was a church and a local store. But now they're destroyed, for this is what Dr. Kornhoff's department called a black spot. Land owned by blacks in an area which the government has decreed can only be owned by whites. Two years ago, the villagers of Nkunzi were deported to resettlement camps. This is Umbulwan, a black spot under threat. A thousand people live here. Suddenly, last year, they were told to move. Government officials came and painted numbers on every cottage. One month after Dr. Kornhoff promised there would be no more forced removals, the police returned to Umbulwan with bulldozers. They demolished houses, scrupulously leaving just one room standing where there had been six before. They went to Kanji, they found that the police was getting all over and the whole thing was found. When they pushed the door, the, the wall down, it nearly hurt us, Mr. Paul. My name is Michael Pensack. I'm the chairman and staff director of the tennis organization. I've been non-renewed three times. It's my goal and I have the right to 
dictate my intentions. It's my resident and I have the right to choose my customers. It's my business and I have the right to choose my employees. These statements articulate the basic philosophy of the landlords, property rights before human rights. They are also the ideological justification for discrimination based on race, sex, and social class. A much larger proportion of tenant households are black, female-headed, and low and moderate income than homeowners. The vast majority of landlords are rich, white males. Tonight, you have heard many tenants testify about the unjust treatment they got from their landlords. You have heard non-landlord homeowners and several civic organizations give their support to the Just Cause Amendment. Attorneys experienced in landlord-tenant law have testified to the inadequacy of the current law to protect tenants from retaliatory eviction, and even some of the good small landlords have come forth to support Just Cause. On the landlord side, you will hear landlords and realtors. You will not hear a broad-based public demand for the continuation of the arbitrary rights of landlords to evict tenants or to not renew their leases. You have asked us to demonstrate need. We have given you statistics, we've given you real cases, we've given you the public need from homeowners and civic organizations, we have documented the legal need by the testimony of attorneys. There is no city mechanism, either in existence now or conceivable in the future, to take the place of a just cause law. You have the opportunity tonight to vote in favor of a just cause law. We believe that vote should be yes. We have a communique from the Socialist Party of Illinois to all progressive groups in the Chicago area. The Socialist Party of Illinois, at the request of its Chicago North Side branch, would like to propose a public forum to be held Sunday, November 11th, to discuss elections 1984, the aftermath. The format we suggest would be a panel representing the various movements with open participation by the audience forum style. The date commemorates those eight-hour advocates who were hanged in 1887 here in Chicago, the attack on the Lumber Workers Hall in 1919 with the subsequent jailing of the leadership and the end of World War I. In the 1984 Orwellian world of Ronald Reagan, we need to discuss where do we go from here. We suggest also a series of cooperative events following the November 11 meeting. The series could include keynote speakers, labor movies, or movies related to other movement issues. The overall planning would be done by a committee representative of the various sponsoring organizations. For any such venture to work, well, we have to do some collective thinking about it in advance. If you're interested, contact us at the Socialist Party of Illinois, Post Office Box 1696, Skokie, Illinois, 60076, or call at It should be pointed out that these struggles are united struggles. Uh, it is not really possible to defeat a Percy or Verdoliac without at the same time challenging Reagan. And it's not possible to consistently challenge Reagan without at the same time challenging the Percy's and the Verdoliacs. And if there's something really exciting that has happened over the last period, it is the possibility of changing the face of Congress, changing the 
face of the political scene on the local and state level as a result of the hundreds of thousands of new voters who have come into the electoral process. Uh, so that we shouldn't focus exclusively on, on Reagan. Uh, we're talking about a whole system. And when we talk about the fight against Reagan, we're not talking about <coughs> trying to remove an individual from office. Uh, if we only had Reagan to deal with, it would be very easy. <laughs> because the man really isn't uh, even uh, uh, intelligent enough himself to uh, orchestrate uh, uh, the kind of campaign that would be a winning campaign. Uh, I'm convinced. <laughs> We're talking about... <laughs> so we're talking about defeating the forces behind the Reagan administration, the military-industrial complex, uh, the most racist, the most sexist, the most warmongering sectors of the monopoly capital system. Those are the very same forces who support or for which a Percy speaks, for which a Verdoliac speaks. Uh, and so we have to see that as a, uh, as a, as a, as a broad campaign that eventually uh, will be able to uh, oust uh, 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 many of these people from office. I think we can... May you receive a greeting on the part of the Salvadoran people. Esta caravana por la paz y la justicia en Centroamérica. From this caravan for Salvadoran caravan for peace and justice in Central America. Está formada por obreros, estudiantes. This caravan is comprised of workers, of students. Y empleados de todos los niveles del pueblo salvadoreño. And workers from all the different levels of the Salvadoran people. Esta caravana comenzó el 27 de julio. This caravan began the 27th of July. Hemos visitado 22 ciudades. We have visited 22 cities. Hemos hablado con miles de personas del pueblo de los Estados Unidos. We have spoken with thousands of the North American people. Denunciando la agresión del gobierno de Reagan en contra del pueblo salvadoreño. Denouncing the military intervention on the part of President Reagan against the Salvadoran people. Y rogando, pidiendo al pueblo de los Estados Unidos. And asking of the people of the United States. Una solidaridad militante para el pueblo salvadoreño. A strong show of solidarity for the Salvadoran people. El objetivo de esta caravana por la paz y la justicia en Centroamérica. The objective for this caravan for peace and justice in Central America. Quiere alertar al pueblo de los Estados Unidos. Wants to alert the people in the United States. En contra de la invasión militar. En contra del pueblo salvadoreño. Against the military intervention that is against the Salvadoran people. Todavía es tiempo de que esa invasión sea detenida por el pueblo de los Estados Unidos. Still there is time that this invasion can be stopped by the North American people. Después nos, la, 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 nos la, lamentaremos ambos pueblos si ahora no actuamos. ¿Cómo? Después nos lamentaremos ambos pueblos si ahora no actuamos. And now we ask that both people act. Pueblo de los Estados Unidos, escuchen la voz de un pueblo que está clamando justicia, paz y libertad. Gracias. People of the United States, listen to the voice of a people who are asking for peace and freedom and justice. The, the question uh, which has just been asked is, we have heard a great deal that 
the actions of the death squads have decreased and that the murders uh, that have been going on for years in El Salvador are decreasing in number. Uh, would uh, they comment uh, on this? The comment will be made here by our noble Dia. Quiere saber si los escuadrones de muertos, si es la realidad que ellos están trabajando menos en estos días, si hay, si hay menos asesinación, asesinaciones. Asesinatos. Well, until, until this moment, we know that in somehow it's not true that they have been killing about 20 people per day and also, yes, in the Last five years, as all of you know, uh, they have been killed with the army more than 50,000 Salvadorians, plus 40,000 who have been disappeared. Our Bishop, uh, Monsignor Rivera Dama, says that 400 people have been killed since, since Duarte's election. This means that Duarte is not uh, controlling the death squad, that the killing of the people is still going on. When I arrived in September, I was shocked at how apathetic and how there was nothing going on. But since Christmas, since the CIA demonstration, the Calero demonstration, and, and then now we have this, which we have hundreds of people involved in, and every day there are more people coming around. So I'd like to see a sort of general awakening of political consciousness. It's like people aren't afraid to talk of politics now. Tell us a little bit about those earlier demonstrations that you were at, because as you were just telling me, that they built up to this and that there was a progression. Yeah, right. The first one that happened, I think it was in January or February, was the CIA, because the CIA recruit here every year, and every year they have a demonstration. This year we had Where about... Where do they do their recruiting? The in? recruiting's at Scott Hall, Scott. which is over just the back of the Mandela Center. They, uh... Last year they had about 20 or something. This year we had 60, 70, 80, 90 people. The most successful CIA demo they've had. And this is linked also that there are, I mean, the CIA were being chased off campus on other colleges throughout the country. And so uh, we had uh, just a demonstration outside. Then we had uh, some people went upstairs and there was a bit of nobody knew what to do, whether we should go in and sit down. There was a confrontation with the police and we eventually backed off. But then we, that was followed by the Calero thing. Again, the Calero thing was a very spontaneous uh, demonstration. I mean, no groups, including the International Socialist Organization, planned to disrupt that because, you know, we were judging that, well, we may go in and we'll, we'll boo when people applaud because we thought that most people would be for him speaking. As it turned out, we were shocked. I think all the other groups were shocked at the, the vocal opposition to Calero. I know the Conservatives claimed that it was like a third of the people. Well, I was there and that, that hall was absolutely going crazy with people who did not want that man to speak. There was a census taken among the crowd by different individuals as to whether we should actually go into the meeting or not. And most people were for doing that if there was enough people to go in because we didn't want to go in on the basis of just feeling like we'll get arrested and accomplish nothing we felt if we want to go in we're going to go in as an organized group and try to accomplish the defeat of calero actually speaking and so when it did come time or you know shortly before 7 p.m when he was supposed to speak i understand that there was only about five people that had actually came in and sat down that were in support of actually hearing him speak. So the picket line actually moved into the hall and basically what happened was people started to chant. People started to chant that fascists have no right to speak and also Nicaragua si, contras no. And that chanting in organization, you could feel the room, you could feel the excitement that people were not going to let this person speak. And it started, you could see it gained support throughout the room in terms of fighting against the war in Central America. And so what happened is that some, some of the organizations actually had speakers get up on the stage and ask questions to the crowd. In other words, almost turned it into Instead of a forum and gaining support for the contra aid, it turned into a, a forum of the working class where we spoke about the war and how we can actually start to defeat it. But the good thing about the Calero incident was that 
from that day on, the Daily was full of politics, and it was about the right to free speech, the Contras. I mean, unfortunately, I think it was too, being America, it was too, too much focused on this right to free speech. I mean, what the Contras do in Nicaragua seem to have been forgotten in front of this sort of abstract ideal of free speech.